engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Good evening. It is 4.08. I am Eric Erickson. This is WSB coming to you an hour early today, preempting Hannity. Why? Because I, I won't say that traffic is snowstorm level bad, but it is pretty bad outside. Between the storms, you got the, the flooding situation out there right now. Um, we are in a lull for the next little while here on radar, um, but it's a mess outside and the roads are bad because of all the water that's been falling. Right now, it's sprinkling around the east side of the perimeter. Um, you head up uh, 85, though, and the further north you go, you get into rain. Uh, head up to Gainesville, and you got a lot of rain there. Uh, you go out I-20 towards Covington. You're going to start getting rain there. The east side is relatively fine right now. 575 is good up to ball ground. The problem is that the way that the storm is circulating counterclockwise, we've got another wave that's coming into the metro area and at this time of day as well you get these just random pop-ups um if you're headed south side on 85 you're good until you get past noonan and then you start getting sprinkles and then down 75 all the way to Macon. the further you go down towards Macon, the worse the weather gets and that's all headed north to us so you got traffic is a mess you've got weather is a mess um and we wanted to come to you early today now this also gives me time to talk about something I, I've, I've touched on intermittently. There is national news. We will get into the Russia investigation. But I want to spend some time locally because the, the primary is next week. And there's a Survey USA poll out now that has Casey Cagle at basically 35%, Brian Kipp at 17%, Hunter Hill at 10%. The Cagle campaign, several people have told me, have started running attack ads on Hunter Hill, uh, which suggests to me, based on the polling, they don't want Hunter Hill in the, in the runoff. Uh, they're trying to shape it to be Cagle versus Kemp. I've told you all I thought it was going to be that. It looks like it's going to be that based on all the polling. I don't know that there's enough time uh, for anyone else, including Michael Williams and his deportation bus that we'll get into, to surge. But there are other races that by virtue of the media attention to the national races, they do not get the major attention that they deserve. And I'm not actually even talking about statewide races. These are individual local races, uh, but it affects all of you, even if you don't live in the particular districts, because of what is happening. You see, in the last year in the legislature, there were a number of bills that were put forward by special interests. You know, one of them was the puppy mill piece of legislation, for example. Uh, we talked about that here on the show. Uh, the puppy mills in the state hired lobbyists to try to draft legislation and get it through the legislature that would prohibit local governments from regulating puppy mills. Uh, another piece of legislation was some good crony capitalist legislation. We had a couple of major corporations that were setting up shop in Georgia and pieces of legislation were winding their way through the legislature, uh, giving these major corporations kickbacks of your tax dollars, special tax breaks that their competitors in the state, all existing Georgia companies uh, didn't support. And in fact, a number of members of the state legislature very publicly cried foul over the legislature trying to hand your tax dollars to out-of-state companies coming in state to compete with existing Georgia companies. And some of that legislation passed, some of it didn't. Uh, but time and time again, we're seeing uh, the same handful of Republicans have stood up and pointed out that the state was using your tax dollars to essentially bribe out-of-state corporations to come in and compete with existing Georgia businesses. Now, the reason the state does this is because it looks good on the economic charts. If the state is bringing business into the state, it makes Georgia look like it's the number one state for business, and they always like to tout that. So it doesn't matter what happens to local businesses in the state of Georgia as long as out-of-state businesses are coming into the state. Now, that's where the benchmarks are set for uh, attractiveness to do business. So give Georgia tax dollars to out-of-state companies, luring them into the state, putting them in an economically competitive uh, advantage over existing Georgia companies, and the state thinks it's winning. So you had a handful of Republicans very loudly pointing that out that this was happening, and in effect were scuttling pieces of legislation supported by the governor, the speaker, the Chamber of Commerce, and elsewhere. So what's happening in the state right now 
unbeknownst to most of you because you're not in the districts, are the people who are the whistleblowers in the legislature on this are being targeted by the Georgia Chamber of Commerce in some very nasty campaigns that are taking shape around the state. And again, the entire reason these conservatives are being targeted is because they were the ones who really led the fight against this crony capitalism uh, that and corporatism that was shaking up the legislature last year. Now, let me give you the names of some of these races. Uh, Sherry Gilligan, David Stover, Marty Harbin, Jason Spencer, who's down in South Georgia, and Matt Gertler. Uh, the, le- the governor himself has come out very strongly against Matt Gertler. He represents uh, the northeastern part of the state. Uh, Hiawassee uh, is up in that area. He represents Helen, the area along the North Carolina state line with Georgia. He represents that beautiful country up there. Uh, And he actually votes against the governor and the speaker more often than many of the Democrats do uh, on fiscal legislation. Uh, He is really opposed to handing Georgia tax dollars to out-of-state businesses. And so Gertler is being challenged by someone uh, who will be a yes man to the Republican leaders. All of them are. I mean, take, for example, Sherry Gilligan is up in Forsyth. I didn't actually back Sherry Gilligan when she ran for the state house. Um, I backed a friend of mine, and Sherry's proven her just weight in gold. She's perfect for conservatives. She's being challenged by someone named Joanna Cloud up in coming. And Joanna Cloud put on her social media uh, that Sherry Gilligan was an example of failed leadership because the governor... Uh, line item vetoed a $6 million state investment for the University of North Georgia in this year's budget. But there's a problem with her saying that. She says he he vetoed a $6 million state investment. Uh, I looked in the budget that went to the governor, and there wasn't a $6 million line item in there, nor can I find a record of the governor vetoing $6 million to the University of North Georgia to punish Sherry Gilligan or for any other reason. In fact, I did find a reference to the state having spent $6 million up there on that facility. Uh, She also claims to have gotten $6,000 from members of the state house. I pulled her disclosures. Uh, Joanna Cloud can say these things, but they're not there in her disclosures. Um, And, you know, I've got a twofold problem with this. She's essentially, Joanna Cloud is, uh, is saying that Sherry Gilligan is being punished for being a conservative, which that happens, but also that the governor is a vindictive SOB who's uh, vetoing money for higher education in the state to punish a state representative. Um, she's making the governor look bad, and it, none of it is true. But what you've got is this Chamber of Commerce group, and she is being backed by this Chamber of Commerce group, Joanna Cloud, against Sherry Gilligan. Uh, There are opponents to Matt Gertler, Jason Spencer, Marty Harbin, David Stover, and other conservatives in the state from this group. And it's really not about the social issues, although that's something. Um, They're trying to recruit more people who are opposed to religious liberty legislation. But more important than that, they're trying to replace conservatives who oppose crony capitalism, the idea that the government should be able to pick winners and losers, that your tax dollars should be used to give one company an advantage against another company. These guys are opposed to that. And because they're opposed, they're getting challenged by this Chamber of Commerce group. This, by the way, this is the same Chamber of Commerce group that accused Michael Williams of beating his wife um, when he was running against the incumbent Senate uh, banking chair. Really, really, really just a nasty group. Uh, you got to pay attention to this stuff. But all of this can happen because uh, the news media only has limited pages. Uh, limited time, and same with radio and TV. We only have limited time. i got to go to commercial break here in just a second. Uh, and so they know they can get away with these under-the-radar uh, races that are local races that no one in the media will pay attention to these local races because it's just not worth our time. I think there's a larger compelling story worth paying attention to, though, that you do have the Chamber of Commerce targeting conservatives in the Georgia legislature because these are the conservatives resisting giving your tax dollars to Fortune 500 companies. Um, the, the shakedown is real, and these guys are standing up to it, and we should probably put the spotlight on this issue because it is ultimately an issue of corruption and the waste of your tax dollars. Now, when we come back, I want to pivot to the deportation bus, Michael Williams' deportation bus. And is Casey Cagle trying to shape the runoff with uh, Brian Kemp to ensure it's Brian Kemp and not Hunter Hill? It is 26 after the hour. I am Eric Erickson. We are preempting this hour of Hannity 
because traffic and weather is a mess in the metro Atlanta area. We right now have a respite from most of the rain. There are light showers in the area, particularly up 85 uh, and down 75, and then down 85 when you get south of Noonan. You get to the east side of the city is mostly clear right now. In fact, if you're heading home today up 75 towards either Chattanooga or even up 575 towards Ball Ground and Jasper, you're fairly good right now, but these bands are circling around the area. Uh, the worst of your commute right now, rain-wise, is going to be up 85 uh, north, whether you're going towards Gainesville or Commerce, and then out uh, towards Augusta on I-20, and then south to Macon, it's going to get worse because the band is starting to move back around towards the metro area. So just be safe out there. Get your headlights on if you can, um, and you should be okay. I want to talk just a minute about the Michael Williams deportation bus. He's not going to be the nominee if the polling is believed. Um, he's polling in the he's in the bottom of the pack, and he's not really getting a ton of media attention. So he's doing the deportation bus. As a way to get attention, uh, and that's part of Michael Williams' problem, is he hasn't had an overall campaign strategy. He's had a series of tactics in the form of stunts. Um, he has uh, showed up outside of a high school to protest and demand a teacher was fired. Uh, he, he generated some bad blood with actual members of the legislature who were viewing his campaign favorably for a while. Um, by his handling of that, and now he's doing the deportation bus. And what it's doing is it's giving Democrats a grievance to run against the Republicans on. It's allowing reporters to get all the other Republicans on the record. What do you think about Michael Williams causing them problems? Um, th th it's all it's all an attention grabbing ploy, but it's not an attention grabbing ploy. Like for example, take the Brian Kemp, the first Brian Kemp ad. Um, with the kid, he, he wasn't pointing the gun at the kid, despite what liberals said. Um, and he, he, it's real hard to put Republicans in an awkward position on that. Or it's even hard. It, it takes something more comparable. The Brian Kemp ad where he says he's got a big truck to round up criminal illegals. Yep, I just said that. Um, that's not putting other Republicans in a position where the media can set them up uh, for bad press. The, the Michael Williams bus is an attention-grabbing stunt that actually hurts the GOP overall. And the reason it hurts the GOP overall is because, well, it galvanizes Democratic voters. It will amp up Democratic turnout. And at a time where Republicans in Georgia actually have been doing credibly well attracting Hispanic voters, it's just another situation that the media can cause the GOP to be awkward with. I, I find it very unfortunate. It, it also reeks of desperation. Um, th that's that's not that's not a stunt a front runner would do. That's a that's something that oh what's his name um, the guy in in West Virginia who went with cocaine Mitch uh, that's what he would do. Disappointing too. Uh, that campaign had so much potential uh, and I don't think they ever had an overall strategy, just a series of tactics. When we come back though, is Casey Cagle trying to shape the field for the for the Republican runoff? It looks like it. I'll tell you what I know. It is 38 after the hour. Eric Erickson here preempting Hannity today because the traffic is just, well, it's a mess. Shiitake mushrooms. Um, and the weather is a mess as well. And I'm glad I'm here because I, I get to, to say I got something wrong yesterday. Uh, and correct the record quickly in less than 24 hours. In the 6 p.m. hour last night, I noted the um, anonymous mail piece that's gone out attacking Hunter Hill and uh, attacking Clay Tippins. And he, they were blaming the Cagle campaign. It doesn't say paid for by uh, the case of Cagle campaign. You would think that the Cagle campaign would own it because the Cagle campaign has in the past been willing to own all their uh, negative things. Go back to the Ralph Reed race. Well, I said, hey, maybe it's someone else wanting you to think it's it's Casey Cagle. I was wrong. It, it, it had to be Casey Cagle. And the reason it had to be Casey Cagle is, did you just hear the ad that we ran on WSB? It's a Casey Cagle ad that amplifies those attacks. And, I mean, take, for example, the, the things attributed to Hunter Hill. They're actually not only distortions, they're not true. 
Um, some of the things like uh, saying that that um, attack, his attack on Donald Trump, th- these things weren't true. Now, what I find interesting about this is that the AJC has a poll that has Hunter Hill and Brian Kemp clustered tightly together for second place headed into the runoff. Survey USA and 11 Alive has a poll that has Brian Kemp at 17% and Hunter Hill at 10%. Casey Cagle, I, I, listen to this, and if you only take one thing away today, take this away. Casey Cagle would not be wasting his money on Hunter Hill and Clay Tippins unless his internal polling had a tighter cluster for second place, and he does not want either of those in the runoff. I mean, it has. I have told you guys. In fact, I've I've had people who would know multiple people tell me that the Keiko camp is salivating to have Brian Kemp in the runoff. They think that if Brian Kemp is in the runoff, he will be uh, more easily attacked because he has a longer, deeper record. Uh, they will be able to shape the race and define him. And they just it'll be a very nasty runoff. But they they very much want Brian Kemp. Uh, Brian Kemp is very happy to be that guy because Brian Kemp, I think, believes that Casey's support is soft, that he has more conservative support. And I I do think he probably has more conservative support. I don't know how soft the, the Kegel support is. I think Kegel support is stronger than a lot of people think it is. Um, But if you're Casey Kegel and you've got millions of dollars and you're going to have a nasty runoff, you don't go after guys who have no shot at being in the runoff. Uh, you go after, you, you hold your fire and go for the runoff. The fact that they're going after Hunter Hill and Clay Tippins is a strong suggestion that they are worried about Hunter Hill or Clay Tippins going into the runoff and they don't want them. In fact, I have had a number of people tell me, in addition to the fact that the Kegel camp wants Hunter Hill, or I'm sorry, wants Brian Kemp, that they don't want uh, Hunter. Now, no one has ever mentioned Tippins. He just hasn't been on people's radar, and I find it curious that he's going after the two um, veterans in the race uh, together. I I think that opens him up to an attack. Why are you attacking the guys who serve the country, Uh, particularly if the polling suggests they're not viable? Uh, They must be viable. And I have had a number of people tell me that uh, the Kegel Kip really doesn't want Brian or really doesn't want Hunter Hill because if Hunter Hill is in the runoff, uh, it's going to be more of a policy fight than a personality fight. Uh, Hunter can explain the Second Amendment stuff uh, and point out that some of the quotes being attributed to him, they're not actually true quotes of his. uh, And so why are people running with them? And when it becomes a policy fight, uh, Hill has been very aggressive on some of the things he wants to do, like getting rid of the income tax, um, making us more competitive with Tennessee and Florida that are both all sales tax, uh, handling transportation differently, budget options, um, not being a, a tool of the Chamber of Commerce, things like that, where you'll have these divides uh, that you would not otherwise have in a Kip Kegel mudsling fest. And so that the only way I can explain that when you got that much money, and you're a week from the primary, and you're going after guys that Survey USA says don't have a shot in the runoff, is that they must actually have a shot at the runoff. Um, Hunter Hill and Clay Tippins, they, they must be viable candidates, and Cagle is trying to shape the field. So uh, it just, it's an interesting turn of events. And so, yes, the, the anti-Hill, anti-Tippins mail piece that has come out uh, clearly had to have come from people associated with Casey Cagle because suddenly this radio ad comes the day after that mail piece goes out. Uh, so definitely there was something behind that. And I still think the polling shows is going to be Cagle versus Kemp. If I had to, if you told me I had to pick, what's it going to be? I think it's going to be Cagle versus Kemp. They're both statewide. They both have statewide name ID. They're both already elected statewide. They both have ground games. I want to talk about that in just a second. They have impressive ground games nobody is paying attention to. Um, but if you're going after Hunter Hill and Clay Tippins, there's a level of viability there 
that I think the polls aren't showing, that internal polls, which tend to be deeper, have more money, a larger pool of voters to draw from, are showing that there could be some concerns, particularly in the metro Atlanta area where they have their bases. So, you know, as as this thing shapes up and we get Cagle and we get Kemp into a runoff, um, man, I just think we're going to have attack after attack after attack after attack. Um, now, in the metro area, you do have an issue because the majority of the primary vote is going to come from the metro Atlanta area. And, and Hunter Hill and Clay Tippins both have a base of support in the metropolitan area. Uh, Hunter Hill is well known in the Buckhead area, highly regarded by the Republicans in that area. Uh, Clay Tippins is a small businessman who is is highly regarded in the area. So it becomes a turnout factor and a turnout ground game. And the two candidates who have really impressive ground games are Brian Kemp and Casey Cagle, which I think does give them an advantage. That's not to say the other candidates don't have ground games. But I, let me tell you about some of the software that's out there right now. And I've looked on the disclosures, and I can tell you that uh, Kemp and Cagle are using the software packages from separate companies. There is software out there now that pulls in all of the voters in the state, the entire voter file, and then it can show you the people who vote in every Republican primary. It can show you the people who only vote in gubernatorial primaries or only vote in presidential primaries or the people who vote locally Democrat in Democratic primaries and then they, they are Republican otherwise. It can show you people who donate money to Republicans. It can't show you who people voted for, but it can show you the pattern of voting. If someone votes in a Republican primary every two years, you know that person is a hardcore Republican and you know that person's going to turn out and vote this time. So what these software packages can do is they can take that data, find everyone who has voted in every Georgia gubernatorial primary for the last decade. Find all those people. Now find everyone who has given money to a Republican presidential candidate. And that shortens the list a little bit. Now find everyone who is also a donor to the NRA. And it shortens the list a little more. So here you've got the hardest of the hardcore gun rights activists. And so now what you do is you say, I've got volunteers in northern Cherokee County. And you draw a little box around the area in Cherokee County where your people are. It says, now show me all of those people who vote in every Republican gubernatorial primary in the last decade, who give money to Republican presidential candidates, and who support the NRA. And it boop, 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 it shows you all those people. Now sort them by their neighborhood, and it'll sort them by their neighborhood. And so then you can send your voter, you can send your volunteers out and knock on just those doors and talk about just gun issues to those people. You can do that now. And the two campaigns in Georgia deploying that sort of software are Kegel and Kemp. And they have operations in every single one of Georgia's counties. And every single one of those, or at least a majority of those counties now, uh, are seeing people do that sort of stuff. They may not have been at your house yet, but they're coming. And they've got this level of grassroots operation that they're building in the primary and testing on their models. And assuming they win, they know their model works, depending on the gra ground turnout that they can measure. They can tweak as needed when they get into the runoff, and then they get into the general election, and they've got a ground game operation that uh, the only Democrat who's putting that together is Stacey Abrams. She's doing something very, very similar on the Democratic Party side, uh, precise pinpoint targeting of voters. Uh, and that on the Republican side really does give Kemp and Cagle a level of advantage of several points percentage-wise over their competitors who don't have the resources to be able to put that level of investment into a ground game. Uh, now, stuff like that isn't sexy. It's not something that reporters write about. Uh, but it's happening, and that's what r wins races. That's why the whole Russia investigation stuff is such nonsense, because uh, the digital targeting on Facebook doesn't really move voters the way someone knocking on your door saying, my guy is with you on this issue, moves voters. It is 55 after the hour. Um 
Now, there's been a school shooting in Dixon High School in Illinois today. In Dixon, Illinois, you're not going to hear about it on the news tonight. The reason you're not going to hear about it tonight is because a school resource officer at the school pulled out a gun and shot the student shooter. Yes, the school resource officer in Illinois did what the school resource officer in Parkland, Florida should have done. Which reminds me, there's a guy running for governor in Tennessee. I don't know him. I know his campaign consultant. His campaign consultant is a longtime friend of mine. And the guy, his name is Bill Lee. And I've been telling people, vote for Diane Black. I, I know her team. She's good people. She'd be a good candidate. Um, but none of the Republicans running for governor in Tennessee are really exciting people. And along comes this Bill Lee guy, which just a, a heck of a biography. His wife and daughter went off for a horseback ride one day when his daughter was young, um, and his wife died. And the horses, if I remember right, um, the story that the horses brought the daughter back, uh, his wife was dead and he had to struggle with keeping his business afloat and raise his girls uh, by himself. And it, just an impressive bio for this guy, small businessman. But he was asked last night if the Parkland High School activist had made the gun issue better. And he said, nope. It's 10 after the hour. I'm Eric Erickson for the official first hour of the show, although we've been going already for an hour. My son uh, has been playing Little League this year, and I, I pushed him a little bit just to just to do something to get out of the house, and he has really enjoyed it, and I have just enjoyed watching him play uh, and to see him just have such a good attitude throughout, whether he strikes out or whether he hits he has such a good attitude, um, and he's got a great arm on him. It's just it's it's cool to watch your kids grow up, you know. Uh, they're just kids are neat. Uh, mine are fascinating. They're starting to outthink me, which is a problem. Now, nonetheless, the phone lines are open here: four zero four eight seven two zero seven five zero one eight hundred WSB Talk. We got to get into the Russia investigation for starters. The city. This is being so badly reported. The New York Times, for example, today has a story about the um, the CIA investigation, code name Crossfire Hurricane, the secret origins of the Trump investigation. Within hours of opening an investigation into the Trump campaign's ties to Russia in the summer of 2016, the FBI dispatched a pair of agents to London, London, on a mission so secretive that all but a handful of officials were kept in the dark. Their assignment, which has not been previously reported, was to meet the Australian ambassador who had evidence that one of Donald Trump's advisors knew in advance about Russian election meddling. After tense deliberations between Washington and Canberra, that would be the capital of Australia, not the, not the water-bogged fruit, top Australian officials broke with diplomatic protocol and allowed the ambassador, Alexander Downer, to sit for an FBI interview to describe his meeting with George Papadopoulos. Ah, oh, it's George Papadopoulos, who was a campaign volunteer at the bottom of the totem pole. All right, y'all. So here's the punchline to this story. It, it literally, I mean, this story goes on and on and on and on it is a lengthy story about how this investigation began and George Papadopoulos and how it appears the Russians wanted to help the president and on and on and on and on you literally literally must go 70 not 7 not 17 70 70 70 paragraphs. You must go 70 paragraphs into the New York Times story before you get to this paragraph that I shall read in full. 
<clears throat> a year and a half later, no public evidence has surfaced connecting Mr. Trump's advisors to the hacking or linking Mr. Trump himself to the Russian government's disruptive, disruptive efforts. But the article's tone and headline, Investigating Donald Trump, FBI sees no clear link to Russia, gave an air of finality to an investigation that was just beginning. Now, this is what's so funny is that the preceding paragraph talks about an article uh, that appeared in the New York Times on October 30th. And it says the key fact of the article that the FBI had opened a broad investigation to possible links between the Russian government and the Trump campaign was published in the 10th paragraph. So here they are noting that the FBI had opened a broad investigation. In It was in the 10th paragraph. This article appeared October 31st, 2016. It took the New York Times 70 paragraphs in today's story, 70 paragraphs, to note that a year and a half later, no public evidence has surfaced connecting Mr. Trump's advisors to the hacking or linking Mr. Trump himself to the Russian government's disruptive efforts. No evidence whatsoever that Donald Trump was involved. No evidence whatsoever that his advisors were involved. Now, the Senate today released its report. Uh, the House report came out and said, basically, uh, the FBI were a bunch of partisans who hated Donald Trump. Um, they made a big show of it. The Senate has kept everything very, very hush-hush. Um, the report has trickled out today, and largely what the Senate says is that the Russians decided to help the president. Ultimately, the Russians wanted to sow discord in the United States. They wanted to disrupt the election. But let's go back to the polling, folks. Everything showed that Hillary Clinton was going to win. All the polling showed Hillary Clinton was going to win. In fact, the polling wound up being right. For all the people who are dismissing the polling, the polling was right. Hillary Clinton won by 2% of the vote, and the polling showed she'd win by 3% of the vote. That that's, That is a perfect polling average. Yes, she won the popular vote. The polling never contemplated the Electoral College, which is why it's so hard to try to steal a presidential election in this country, which is why the Russians couldn't steal it. And what did the Russians decide to do? The Russians wanted to come into the United States and they wanted to sow discord. And Hillary Clinton was dominant. They didn't like Hillary Clinton, but what did they want to do? They wanted to make it a competitive election with both sides against each other. So they threw their hat in behind Donald Trump to try to help him. It wasn't that they wanted Donald Trump elected. It was that they wanted a competitive race. And again, 70 paragraphs into a New York Times story. Today we read, a year and a half later, no public evidence has surfaced connecting Mr. Trump's advisors to the hacking or linking Mr. Trump himself to the Russian government's disruptive efforts. They wait until the end. To tell, I mean, that is literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight paragraphs before the end of this entire article. Eight paragraphs towards the end. Seventy paragraphs in. They tell us there's no evidence. Um, this is why so many people distrust the media. I mean, I, they want to air the grievance. They want to fuel the fire of the left that the Russians stole the election for Donald Trump. And it turns out uh, the Trump campaign, there's no evidence that they coordinated anything. And there's also, this is important in this story, there's no evidence that the Russians stole the election. There's none. There's no evidence the Russians stole the election. The New York Times doesn't really even bother to point that out. It is 26 after the hour. Eric Erickson here. The phone number is 404 872 750 wsb talk Let's go to Mike and Conyers first tonight. Welcome, Mike. Uh, I want. Uh, uh, I don't listen to news very often or follow the political situation. But I was hoping you could uh, kind of elaborate on what substantiation they've come out with that said that Russia threw their hat in the ring for Trump. I mean, I, uh, was that like Facebook's postings or what so form did that take? From the Senate Intelligence Committee, and, and we we've got to make a distinction here that the left and the Democrats don't want to make. It is not that the Russians wanted Donald Trump elected. 
It is that the Russians wanted Donald Trump to do better during the election when all the polling was consistently coming in that he was behind, 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 behind. They wanted a competitive race. And so they wanted to help Donald Trump, not because they wanted Donald Trump elected, but because they wanted both sides in this country fighting each other and distracted, so distracted by the election, they weren't paying attention to the Russia and Crimea and in Georgia and elsewhere. Uh, so my uh, question was, what form did that take? Was uh, so it, it, I mean, t- there were a number of things. One was the social media information warfare. They were targeting members of the press. They were targeting grassroots activists through Twitter and Facebook. Uh, They were producing polling. They also had Russian-backed media outlets in this country uh, that I'll talk about when we get back. It is 539. I am Eric Erickson. This is WSB. The phone number here is 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk. That's T-A-L-K for those of you who are undecided voters at this point, which is probably all of us. Oh, my goodness gracious, y'all. I mean, I am I, – some of these people are friends of mine and I'm voting for, but I'm still so undecided on some races. And looking at the polling out there, more than a third of voters are undecided in most races. And in the lower races, when you get down and like Secretary of State and Insurance Commissioner, you got almost 50 percent undecided. Um, I will tell you, I, I'm voting for Buzz Brockway for Secretary of State. He's a friend of mine. The others are good guys. Um, so no disrespect intended to them. Uh, they're all, they'd all be fine. Secretary of state buzz is a longtime friend. Uh, Jay Florence, I'm voting for insurance commissioner cause well, the other guys got some issues. Um, so Florence, uh, for that one, but man, people are undecided in these races. Now let's go back to the phones. 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Jim in Lithia Springs. Welcome. I, my question is secretary of state. There was a guy that got fired. Which one was it? No, 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 no. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, there's Rex Tillerson at the federal level. No, um, this is the insurance commissioner in Georgia. Um, the yes. insurance commissioner, Ralph Hudgens, had a chief of staff named Jim Beck. Um, Beck was fired by Hudgens, forced to resign, technically, but H- Hudgens says it was a firing. Um, for he essentially went out and got a job somewhere else and was, they were both paying him for 40 hours a week, um, among other issues. So the, his opponent is insurance commissioner. Okay. I got it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Insurance commissioner. Um, so the, the insurance commissioner himself, Ralph Hudgens is backing a guy named Jay Florence, who, who I'm supporting as well, who doesn't have those issues. Florence. Yes, Jay I'm Florence. I'm trying to narrow my list down. Yeah, no, no. Listen, you are not alone. In fact, I, I had to go to Publix earlier today, and there was a lady in there, uh, go to church with her, and she ran into me, and she's like, oh, I'm so glad you were here. I was going to wait until Sunday. She's like, hold on a second. And she pulls out her phone, and she's flipping, 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 flipping. She says, okay, here's my sample ballot. Who do I vote for? It's like, I don't know in some of these races. <laughs> okay, cool. Yep. Yeah, look, you, you are one of millions of people in the same boat, Jim. Thanks very much for calling. Yes, uh, Jay Florence, it, it's it's the insurance commissioner's race. Um, they're they're – uh, Florence is a good guy, um, but yes. So pretty much, she she had this already on her phone, intending to wait until she saw me at church on Sunday so that she could go through the ballot with me. <laughs> at least we don't have all the constitutional amendments and whatnot right now. That that's where it really gets burdensome, man. That that rolls around in November, and you're like, oh, I hadn't even heard of these things. So nonetheless. <laughs> Much appreciated. Y'all, there's still light rain in the area, but I feel a little comfortable closing the radar app right now because stuff is trickling in, but it, it's it's winding down as the sun goes down as it gets into the area. My goodness gracious. Um, I cannot comment on the picture that my buddy Matt just sent me. My goodness, the things you encounter at Publix in Atlanta 
are just, wow, let's move on, shall we? Um, there is a story uh, burning up the, the liberal press today. That It's in Axios, which is actually a kind of cool news site, axios.com. Everything is very short to the point. Um, not The analyses are very concise. But they have a, a piece up about the pro-Trump media alternative. This coincides with a Politico story that Sinclair Broadcasting is trying to lure Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly and, and uh, people fired by Fox. And, and they're trying to start up a new uh, counter to Fox uh, that Fox apparently is not pro-Trump enough. So they're going to go start this new network uh, and be more pro-Trump. Um, the reason that conservatives can get away with this, and this really should be the takeaway point, the reason conservatives can do this is because there is no trust for the mainstream media out there. Look at the coverage of the media and what's happening in Israel. Hamas is using terrorists and others to storm the border with Israel. They're getting shot, many of them killed, and somehow it's the Palestinians who are the bad guys. You have the New York Times quoting people. The Washington Free Beacon pointed this out. The New York Times is quoting a, a human rights group saying it's a violation of international law for Israel to do what it's doing. There, there is no such violation of international law. You have the right to defend your border. And what they're arguing is that um, Israel can't shoot to kill people who are trying to storm its uh, border. And they're just making it up. And it turns out that one of the guys the New York Times is quoting actually is one of those people who really hates Israel and wants private companies to stop investing in Israel. Uh, one of those BDS, um, boycott, divest um, uh, groups, it's it just nonsensical. But the media is so biased against Israel in this. Uh, the, I mean, the flat out, the coverage is lying. They are flat out biased at all times against the president. Look at the New York Times story we just reviewed a while ago. It took them 70 paragraphs before they stated that there are no ties between the president and Russia that anybody's been able to find. And so these media alternatives are cropping up, not because people want Trump cheerleaders at all times. It's because they want something where they believe they're getting told more truth than left-wing lies. And that's what the media can't comprehend. You know, yeah, this show, I would not have been given another contract through the end of 2020 if this show were performing poorly. And there are a lot of people who are rooting against me because I wasn't a presidential supporter. And I've done my level best to try to praise him where I can and criticize him when I think I need to and call balls and strikes. And you can feel free to disagree if you want, and that's fine. But the reason that so many people, whether they agree with me or not, tune into this show is because I try to do my best to give you just the facts that these are the stories. This is what's being gotten right. This is what's being gotten wrong. This is what I know. These are what my sources are telling me. And this is what I got wrong on yesterday's show, if, if that happens. And the media doesn't do that. The media relies on left-wing activists to shape the news. And you know when you open the New York Times, you're not getting a conservative's perspective. And the presuppositions that go into forming the stories don't have your worldview at heart. So the whole pro-Trump media can thrive and grow because the mainstream media continues to fail and treat everyone else very condescendingly. So let's go back. If you're just tuning in um, to the first hour, that Kegel ad, I've now heard that Kegel ad three times. It's the Casey Kegel radio ad attacking Hunter Hill and Clay Tippins. According to the AJC polling, uh, Hunter Hill and Brian Kemper neck and neck for a runoff against Kegel. According to 11 Alive Survey USA, it's... Um, Casey Hagel, 35, Brian Kemp, 17, Hunter Hill, 10, Clay Tippins, 8. There's no reason for Casey Hagel to be spending that much money to circulate that ad over and over and over 
unless he's trying to make sure they don't get into a runoff with him. I mean, because right, the, the the Kegel camp wants Brian Kemp in the runoff. And there's no reason, if all the polling is showing that it is going to be Brian Kemp, there's no reason to go after Hunter Hill and Clay Tippins. All you're doing is you're providing them an incentive to rally to Brian Kemp in the runoff, unless you think they're viable. They could still get there. Um, I, I'm, I get the distinct impression talking to people that Cagle really doesn't want Hunter Hill in the runoff against him. And I don't think you attack people that much unless you think there's a chance. So I wonder what the private polling is showing that the public polling isn't showing. It's nine after the hour. Eric Erickson here, News 95.5 AM 750 WSB. Um, what was I going to... I know, I, this is my third hour. It's so discombobulating because I, I keep an outline and what am I going to look at? And this is an hour two. This is hour three. Amazon and Apple look to Northern Virginia. There's a story in the Washington Post that, well, Atlanta may have lost out. Amazon wants to move to the East Coast. So actually, there's credible reports that they're looking at Boston for their headquarters, but they want to have an expanded presence in the northern Virginia suburbs, as does Apple, which is looking at putting a significant number of employees in northern Virginia. Now, I actually want to tie this back to uh, state news. As I mentioned in the first hour today, I've been on since four. The Chamber of Commerce in Georgia is running campaigns against a number of state legislators here who have been opposed to using state tax dollars to bribe companies. And that's what it is, is bribing companies to come to Georgia at the expense of Georgia businesses. Now, why do I relate this to this other story? It has actually nothing to do with the Amazon um, headquarters in Atlanta. It has everything to do with Washington, D.C. That the Washington, D.C. area is becoming the hub for the wealthy in this country. There's a report out that the United States has more billionaires than China and India and... Uh, one other country, I mean, the most populous countries on earth, we've got more billionaires than all of them. Many of them are not on the West Coast in Silicon Valley. They're in Washington, D.C. now. They've moved there to be close to power. The moral of the story is you're not going to be able to compete with the Washington, D.C. power. And it is also an indication that the conservatives in Washington, the Republicans, I should say, have failed. They have claimed to be for limited government for so long, and they have failed. Uh, they had no intention of succeeding. They, If Washington, D.C. were not the center of the universe in terms of government power and policy these days, if limited government had actually been successfully deployed by the Republicans, you would not have all these Fortune 500 companies trying to set up shop in Washington, D.C. So the moral of the story is Atlanta is not ever going to be able to compete with that because we are not the nation's capital, just the capital of Georgia, maybe the capital of the Southeast, although Charlotte uh, would take issue with that. But we still have a Chamber of Commerce in Georgia, that wants to engage with your tax dollars in luring massive companies into Georgia. The problem I have, and this came up a lot in my conversations with the gubernatorial candidates. The Democrats and most of the Republicans actually agreed on this point. Um, Hunter Hill and, and Brian Kemp spent a good bit of time, and, and Michael Williams spent a good bit of time on this point, that more often than not, it is the policy of Republicans in this state to use your tax dollars to lure companies from out of state into this state at the expense of existing businesses already here. We are putting Georgia companies at a competitive disadvantage. And the chamber is launching campaigns against Republicans in the legislature who oppose that. And we should all oppose that. 
And the fact that the good guys stand up and oppose it and then you get the Chamber of Commerce after them should tell you everything you need to know about the screwed up priorities when it comes to making and creating and growing stable businesses in Georgia. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to detour for just a minute. I was checking email, looked in my spam folder. So I, I get emails occasionally from some company that sends out and says, um, Merrick Woods below or job openings that match your profile. And, and I don't know... What this? I guess I set this site. I, I I have no idea. I don't recognize this site. Um, and I've looked back, and I get these now. It looks like I've been getting them once a week, and they vary. And all these things are are legit opportunities, like job opportunities. And so, for example, um, they say based on my profile, uh, there's a a host position at a Marriott hotel in the Metro Atlanta area. The hotel won't be designated until you. Go through the application process. There's a the Blue Ridge Grill has an opportunity has an opening for a host. Bar Mercado has an op- opening for a host. But I'm looking, and then these two other job opportunities is is one is a a beer taster, uh, tester taster for a local brewery that will go unnamed until you go through the process. But then the other one is an an out of state uh, edibles vendor, which I take to be like marijuana. <laughs> I should do that job. I can go apply for that. And I, I don't know how legal that one would be, but oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> an edibles, an edibles tester. <laughs> Consume this product. And do you, does the world around you slow down to a crawl? Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know why they think I qualify for that position, but the, the the brewery taster tester position I I could totally go for that one yes totally <laughs> okay now um you know I told you guys the other day that um it, just based on history and pattern and practice it, the Democrats the odds are with them for taking the House of Representatives not necessarily the Senate this year but the Democrats are starting to freak out completely over California because they did something dumb. They did what's called a jungle primary. Dun, dun, dun. What a jungle primary is, it's what I grew up with in Louisiana. It's from the the French Civic Code um, processing where all the candidates would pile onto a common primary ballot. So, for example, if this was in Georgia, when you went to go vote in the primary this coming Tuesday, you would have all the candidates together on a ballot. Uh, so for governor, you would be able with one ballot to choose uh, Stacey Evans, Stacey Abrams, Brian Kemp, Casey Cagle, Clay Tippins, uh, Michael Williams, and any candidates from any third parties, the Libertarians, what have you, they'd all be there. And you would pick, and the top two people would go into a runoff. Uh, whether that runoff and that runoff would be in November, uh, whether that runoff would be two Republicans got the most votes or two Democrats got the most votes or a Republican, a Democrat or a Libertarian, what have you. It's called the jungle primary. All the parties compete together on a primary ballot. It's really dumb. It, it denies the parties their representation. It's constitutional, though. And it was through a ballot initiative in California. And the reason that it happened is because Democrats thought it would be a great way to further shut out Republicans. You need to understand that, that this is so Democrats could shut out Republicans. Well, what's happening now is that so many Democrats in California want to run for Congress to run against Donald Trump. They filled up the ballot and the Republicans are only putting in two people in each of these races. And so in many of these these areas of the state, many of these congressional districts, if the Republicans all turn out and just divide up their vote between two people, well, they could potentially dominate on the ballot and have a November election of two Repu- Republican versus Republican because so many Democrats are running. It's hurting them. The, the Democratic Party is now spending massive amounts of money in California to try to prevent that from happening. They are diverting resources from other areas of the country to try to make sure uh, that at least one Democrat makes it in each of these congressional races in November. Uh, the law of unintended consequences, except many people predicted that could happen. Democrats just didn't believe them.
Let me stop for just a minute and promote one of our sponsors. Thanks to Dollar Shave Club for sponsoring this week's show. And, you know, I was actually one of the original members of Dollar Shave Club. Back in the day, I was a lawyer when they came out. They had that awesome ad, and I totally bought into it because I was tired of paying for my razors um, at the grocery store price. It is a great company, and the razors are very, very solid. You go to dollarshaveclub.com, and you can see they got more than just razors, and it's so much better than shopping in a grocery store and you know so i got they sent me a packet before this promo began as if i needed them because i got some um but they got a great razor and they've got great shave cream they've got a body cleanser they even have the one wipe charlies i'll let you decide whether or not you like them or not but you know it's a great it's a great product uh really really do like it uh their dr carver shave butter is fantastic and given that i am prone to rashes and whatnot i only shave every other day because of it i'm sure Sure you wanted to know that um but it actually works and i don't break out uh so i highly do recommend dollar shave club i have been a dollar shave club member for well gosh i was a lawyer it's been a long time since i've you how long have they been around? i don't know anyway they've been around forever um solid solid company great people great idea too they were the first you got all these other competitors out there and they were the first to come out and say you know what we can beat the other guys so a great innovator. You can clean up your bathroom and your morning routine. Join Dollar Shave Club today for just $5. With free shipping, you'll get the six-blade executive razor plus trial sizes of shave butter, body cleanser, one-wipe Charlies. Then keep the blades coming for a few bucks more a month. Way cheaper than what you'll get at the grocery store, by the way. Get yours at dollarshaveclub.com slash Eric, E-R-I-C-K. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash Eric. Let us go to the phones here at 526 on WSB. The phone number is 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. John and Hushton, welcome. Hey, Eric. Happy Wednesday, brother. You too. Hey, thanks for uh, keeping it real, calling balls and strikes, and, uh, you know, let us know how you make out on your uh, 90 days of uh, brew testing. <laughs> uh, on, on Brew testing and edibles. <laughs> <laughs> so, a hey, uh, question for you, my friend. Um, do candidates, you know, local candidates that we hear running for governor now, do these folks ever, you know, put their name or, you know, partner with or stand by a nonprofit and or do they disclose, you know, what they give to charities? Um, you know, if they release their tax returns, you can see their charitable deductions, but normally no, um, it, it's hard to do unless they want to make it public, uh, at the state level. There, there are differences in federal regulations, but then nobody has to release their tax return. So it's, it's hard to find out which nonprofits they support. Is it, is it part of a, you know, casual conversation for say a guy like yourself might be, you know, having a sweet tea with a you know, with a candidate, do they ever share, well, you know, here's where my heart is, and, you know, th this is where, you know, I'd like to... Yeah, it, it is something and, that, that may come up. I, I don't know that it has come up in any of those conversations. Maybe I need to become the brewmaster edible tester and, and share some with them and, and let them really open up. It's just called a night of awareness. Yes. Say, hey, <laughs> you know, anyway, that, that was it, man. Thanks for, you know, thanks for keeping it real. And when you uh, mentioned the, uh, the jungle... Louisiana, my mind immediately went to George, George, George of the Jungle. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, man. Good to hear from you. And by the way, folks, I will be in Hushton on Friday night at the train depot at, at 7 p.m. Uh, my friend Sam Thomas is running for the state house over there. He writes at the Resurgent. Great uh, young guy. Really have enjoyed getting to know him and his dad. Uh, over the last couple of years, he's running for the state house, uh, Republican primary, and I told him I'd be happy to come over and do an event with him. So if you're in the Hushton area on Friday night, uh, I'll be at the train depot at seven o'clock. When we come back, we will take more of your calls, 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. And I'm interested to hear what you guys think about the deportation bus from the Michael Williams campaign.
It is 39 after the hour. The phone number here is 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk. Uh, I'm going to go back to the phones to Ron and Cumming. Welcome. How are you? I'm great, Eric. How are you doing this afternoon? Great. All right. So I've got a question for you. I respect your, your opinions as a conservative. Um, I'm from Cumming, uh, voting yes for the city of Sharon Springs. And uh, in my view, it's, it's a matter of, of gaining uh, a lot of control over our future, putting our, our government as close to people as possible, as well as uh, uh, creating some identity for us. But the opposition is saying that it's not a conservative value or it's, it's against conservatism to have what they call another layer of government. And I just feel like it's, it's the right layer of government. I want to get your opinion on that. Well, you know, I I don't know that it, it, there is specifically a conservative or a liberal position on on municipal creation. I mean, for example, I was on the the city council down in Macon for a while. Uh, I never did learn what the partisan position on trash collection was. Um, there are certainly conservative and liberal values, and I think one of the conservative values is certainly to have uh, the government closest to you make the most decisions for you. And I guess the question is, is the the county unable to make those decisions, thus you need another level of government? Because that ultimately is what's happening, is you'll be creating another level of government. I, I will tell you where I think it becomes a conservative issue, and that is much like the situation we had in Fulton County, where you had a county government that completely, willfully, uh, and offensively routinely ignored the needs of people in South Fulton County, uh, would not send resources, would not develop parks, uh, would not expand law enforcement presences, and they needed to incorporate. Uh, or you take the city of Dunwoody example, where it was for DeKalb County a hub of taxation to then redirect those tax dollars elsewhere. I mean, if you are in a in an area of your county where your tax dollars are being redirected somewhere else and you're not getting the benefit of those tax dollars, uh, then yeah, form a local government in your area that can then do a better job of policing and securing the, the betterment of the people. Um, I, I don't think there's a necessary conservative or liberal divide over the creation of a uh, city government. The The issue is why are you doing it? Is it because you want another level of bureaucracy uh, so that you can then help the expand the welfare state in your area? Well, then that's probably a bad reason to do it. Uh, if it is because your tax dollars are constantly being redirected to subsidize someone else and you want greater control of it in your area, well, then, yeah, I think that's a conservative reason to create a city. I, I hope that answers your question. Sure does. I appreciate it, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a, a lot of people try to pigeonhole particular issues in on this is liberal or this is conservative. And a lot of times it goes to the underlying motivation of it. Um, and so for municipal creation, I, I, I don't think there's a bright line. Yes, it, it is. I, I see the overall argument that you're creating another government. So you're creating another entity that's going to raise your taxes and going to spend your money. Um, but the question is, um, why why are, do people want that option? Most people don't want their taxes raised, so why are they doing it? And if it is like a situation that so many in Fulton County had when they incorporated Johns Creek and elsewhere as well, that they had to do it because their money was being redirected away from their local community and they weren't getting the benefits of their tax dollars, then I think that's a very conservative reason to create a municipality. Um, yeah, this This deportation bus thing... It's definitely getting a lot of coverage for uh, Michael Williams' campaign. I, I don't know it's the benefit. You know, if you're in the camp that I used to know a guy, he, he was a PR guy, worked for a Georgia congressman, and he really believed that all coverage was good coverage. There was no such thing as negative press. And if you're in that camp, um, then the, the attention that the Michael Williams deportation bus is getting, I guess, is good attention. Um but I, I don't, I'm not in that camp and there's a, there is a level of running it. Let's just say if you're Donald Trump, you could probably get away with this. And this is one of the problems that people around the country are having as they campaign. Um, Donald Trump is Donald Trump. You are not Donald Trump. Uh, if you want to act exactly like uh, Donald Trump, then you may find that you don't get the benefit of it. 
because you're not Donald Trump. And the Williams campaign running this deportation bus, I don't think it's going to take his polling. Listen, regardless of the the where the polling is precisely or not, Williams may be able to get a bump out of this, but I don't think it's going to be a, a 10-point bump, which is really about the amount of people he would need to persuade to suddenly find himself in a competitive position to get into the runoff. Uh, what he will do is find himself being the spectacle the negative spectacle that the other candidates distance themselves from uh, around the state. Uh, he's not making himself. I guess what I'm getting at is at this point, it seems like you see the polling, unless you're absolutely deluded, he's probably not going to win. It's not close. Um, so how do you put yourself in a position then to make yourself useful with a future political career? Or have you just decided to commit essentially political suicide, uh, which seems like this is the course he set on. Uh, spectacle and tactics, not strategy and, and strategic thinking to get into a runoff or make himself viable. I mean, if, if Michael Williams is really at 3% in the polling, then whoever gets into the runoff against Cagle really doesn't necessarily need him. Um, and I guess he can go back to his small businesses. I just, I think this deportation bus thing uh, harms his credibility long term and harms the credibility of the Republicans who now all of the media is going to be rushing to them and taking them off their messages, taking them off the message of how liberal Stacey Abrams is. And so what do you think about the deportation? What would you do to the deportation? Don't you think it's racist? I mean, they've just opened he's opened the media up to an easy out to go after the Republicans. Uh, he's doing more harm than good with this to the overall side that he claims to be on. Unless it really is all about himself. And if it is all about himself, he's not actually helping himself there either. Uh, I think this deportation bus was a bad idea. It's Eric Erickson here, 55 after the hour. I uh, don't really know that we necessarily have time to take another phone call, so we won't. Um, I, I just, I, I'm really, I, I hope if you've tuned in and out tonight that you've gotten a sense of just how often this Kegel radio ad against um, Tippin and Hill has been, which again, I just would point to you that if the polling is accurate, then there's no way that either one of them goes into the runoff. So why do you run an ad that much against them uh, unless your polling suggests that uh, they might have a shot? Um, it, it is worth noting, I think, and it's been consistently so across the candidates um, that all the polling has rather specifically shown there not being an opportunity, a path forward for the Williams campaign, despite his deport, maybe the deportation bush will change it. Um, what I think certainly has changed, though, is if you look at the bump uh, for Brian Kemp, uh, his advertising campaign has locked people in for Brian Kemp, uh, taking a, a humorous approach. He's not attacking anybody else. Uh, he's not going negative. He's just, this is me and these are my issues. This is what I'm about. Uh, a pretty compelling message to push him into the runoff. We will find out on Tuesday night who goes. 